I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. and Let us exalt his name together. Greetings, beloved. I'm so happy to once again be sharing with you uh, here. And thank you for joining us at the Alpha Street Baptist Church. And I pray today that something is said, uh, perhaps that you will leave the better. Recently, I was recommended an article by Dr. Robert Stewart. He's a professor of philosophy and theology at the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. Of this particular article was centered on what is theology and what is the role of a theologian? What is, theolo what is theology? Etym etymologically, the word prefix theo, renders itself to God, ology, science of, or study. It's the theology, it's the study of God. But what, is, is, what is this that Stewart speaks of? Stewart says that theology, engaging with theology, is essentially an exercise in worldview thinking. And amongst a number of things, Stewart suggests that a worldview seeks to tell a story that answers five specific questions. Who am I? Where am I? What is wrong? What time is it? And what is the solution? The theologian is concerned with question, questions such as who is God? How should I understand the natural world? And what's wrong with the world? This is the task of the theologian to weave the story that answers all of these questions into a coherent whole. Who is God? And how does that inform who I am and where I am? And what's wrong? And where are we in time? And ultimately, what is the solution? Who are they? They are the children of Israel. Where are they? We find them in exile. What's wrong? They have no desire to be there. And their history begins in the Garden of Eden all the way to the great exodus from Pharaoh's land of bondage. And because of their unfaithfulness to the covenant with Yahweh, they have been carried away from their homes. What time is it? They find themselves located within a 70 year exile somewhere between the fifth and the sixth century. What's the solution? What is the solution? That is the question that plagues all of us and even them. And if you don't mind, I want to suggest uh, some insight and perspective from my favorite theologian. No, not one of those ancient fathers, the likes of Augustine or Tertullian or Origen or any of those individuals. No, not Howard Thurman or even that of uh, J.D. Otis Roberts or James Cone, no. Not anybody from the particular womanist perspective. Not anyone from the Lutheran uh, perspective. Nobody from the Catholic Church, no. I want to suggest a line from my favorite theologian, the daughter of Mary and Luther Hill. Grew up in Blue Mountain, Mississippi. Probably can't even find it on the map. Every day when she was a little girl, she would have to walk seven miles to clean three houses in particular that each paid her $2.50. That she would walk back from her job to hopefully have food as the white family she would work for would feed her on the back porch. Her name is Dorothy Sanders, who I get the pleasure of affectionately calling Granny. My favorite theologian, Granny, growing up, Granny had a line that she would say, to my brothers and I that served as a means of correction in rearing, but I think is also a lens and perspective by which we can view our text today. Granny would tell us it's not that it's nasty. It just doesn't taste good. Hear the word of the Lord as we find, as we come today, Jeremiah chapter 29, beginning at verse 11. It's a familiar passage. It reads like this, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. 
Then you will call upon me and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you to exile. I want to tag this text with this thought. This doesn't taste good. I can remember being with Granny and we always had the pleasure of going over Granny's house and we could eat whatever we wanted. But perhaps immediately upon tasting the food, being spoiled children as we were, I would remark, Granny, this is nasty. To which she would always answer back, Ty, it's not that it's nasty. It just doesn't taste good. I know I'm from the South, but I really cannot stand sweet tea. Granny would put it cup of sweet tea on the table, I'd push it back to the center of the table in rejection saying, Granny, this is nasty. And Grandmama would say, it's not that it's nasty, Ty. It just doesn't taste good. For the life of me, I can't understand why some of you enjoy eating corn and cranberry sauce. And specifically on Thanksgiving, I would be given these particular dishes to which I would always reject and push back to the middle of the table. Grandmama, this is nasty. To which Granny would always respond back, Ty, it's not that it's nasty, it's that it doesn't taste good. You see, Granny had a different interpretation on the, my interpretation of my lack of pleasure. Because whatever I was eating at the time, I called nasty, but she corrected saying it doesn't taste good. Because for Grandmama, the word nasty implies something different. For her, she says that nasty means that the person that prepared it either prepared it with ill intentions or, or was utilizing unclean utensils. Not tasting good was not a judgment on the intention of the preparer, but rather forced us to, and to look at the person that was tasting the food. The problem wasn't with the individual that prepared it. The problem was with your preferences. I believe that we can learn something from grandmama today and perhaps even the children of God in our text today, that they find themselves in a very interesting predicament, that they are in exile. Now, they didn't just haphazardly get there. They don't just get to this particular position by themselves, but rather they demonstrated a lack of faith in God and a refusal to participate in the covenant with God. They worshiped their own gods and wanted to be like those that surrounded them. And God allowed their enemies to overtake them. And the people in our text are located in Babylon and things are not pretty. They have to sleep in beds that don't belong to them. They have to eat from tables that they do not recognize. They're listening to music that they are not accustomed to, that they are in a place of total discomfort. And like good church people, they decide to have revival. And, and, and I mean, Alfred Street, you should have been there on these particular nights. I mean, that first night was, my, was almost one of the most powerful nights I've ever seen. That people were snodding and running around the church and going crazy and shouting and giving God praise because the preacher that night was saying, hey, everything is going to be all right. The preacher that night was telling them that they were just anointed for such a, a time as this. And that preacher's name was Reverend Hananiah. And he came and he told them a number of things. He told them that their blessing was on the way. He told them that their breakthrough was there, that favor was on their life. And almost at every word, the people were hanging on to his every word. But the preacher for the next night was by the name of Jeremiah. Nobody likes to hear from Jeremiah. Well, Hannah and I always would tell people what they wanted to hear. Jeremiah came with a different tone and a different message. You see, Jeremiah came saying, yeah, I know what Hananiah said this first night. But I'm trying to tell you what Hananiah told you isn't the truth of the word of God. That Hananiah was telling them that their deliverance would come in about two years. But Jeremiah wanted to be clear that no God's word for you is not that you'll be delivered in two years. As a matter of fact, you got 70 more years. Let's be honest. Don't nobody come to church to hear them be pushed into a more responsible relationship with Jesus Christ. Nobody comes to church to hear you better get yourself to self together. That nobody comes to church to hear that God isn't going to bring you out of it this particular time. We find our brothers and sisters here in what seems 
to be a nasty situation. But the word of the Lord through the prophet Jeremiah is that it's not that it's nasty, Israel. It just doesn't taste good. That this happens all the time throughout scripture that God oftentimes does is that God will give us a different take on our trouble that refers sometimes refers to our trouble in James chapter one, verses two, two and three. Consider it great joy, my brothers and sisters, that whenever you experience great trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. We say that it's nasty, but God reminds us it doesn't taste good. First Peter chapter one, verse six, you rejoice in this, even though now for a short time, if necessary, you you suffer grief in various trials so that the proven character of your faith more valuable than gold though which is perishing is refined by the fire may result in praise glory and honor and revelation at Jesus Christ we say it's nasty but God says it doesn't taste good second Corinthians chapter 4 verse 7 God uh, uh, Paul says for our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory so we do not focus Focus on what is seen, but what is on what is unseen for what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. That this is the message of people. This is a message today for people that favor has not arrived. This is a message for people that are forced to live between what they prefer, prefer and what God does. I know somebody saying, yeah, that's the scriptures, the scriptures record. But there's somebody listening to me that this is also your very experience that God gave you the relationship and you've rejected it pushing it back to the middle of the table saying God this is nasty but today God is wanting to correct your perspective and say no it's not that it's nasty it just doesn't taste good somebody saying I'm pushing my and rejecting my finances back to the middle of the table God I don't like this and God is pushing it back in front of you saying no it's not that it's nasty it just doesn't taste good somebody saying this child that I prayed so long for Lord this is nasty but God is pushing it back saying no, it's not that it's nasty. It doesn't taste good. And allow God to transform your perspective because uh, there's a difference between nasty and not tasting good. When it doesn't taste good, family, I want to let you know that God assumes total responsibility. Jeremiah chapter 29, beginning at verse 4, notice what it says. It says, this is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says to all the exiles, I deported from Jerusalem to Babylon. They are in exile, living in a strange land, and have heard the word from false prophets telling them that the time of their departure is, is coming to an end. But God, through Jeremiah, sends a word of correction saying, this is what the Lord of the armies, the God of Israel, says to the exiles, I deported from Jerusalem to Babylon. There isn't much issue with the letter initially until you get to the end of the first sentence. Notice again, don't skip over it. It says, God who is speaking says, I deported from Jerusalem to Babylon. God takes responsibility for where they are. What am I to do when God is the cause of my discomfort. It's a question that deserves attention for this passage because their prayer and expectation was for immediate deliverance, but God answers back with prolonged endurance. What are you and I to do? You see, I grew up in church like some of y'all, and we would grow up singing that song, everything that happened to me that was good, God did it. But the flip side of that coin is, not only everything that happened to me that was good, God did it, but also everything that is bad that happened to me, God also allowed. And the tension is not with what God did, but oftentimes my struggle is what is with what God has allowed. What are you to do when there's tension between what God did and what God allowed? You know, here at Alpha Street, we say, that we should read the Bible because when we read the Bible, it'll make you a better Christian. That's what it says in verse four. But read verse five. It says, build houses and live in them. 
Plant gardens and eat their produce. Find wives for yourselves and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters to men in marriage so that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there. Do not decrease. Pursue the well-being of the city. I have deported you to pray to the Lord on its behalf for when it thrives, you will thrive. None of this language to these people that is what they expected. As a matter of fact, God is saying you got another 70 years. And history would prove that they were trying, uh, attempting to rebel against Babylon at this time. But God says, no, do not rebel. Build houses and live in them. Uh, uh, um, uh, plant gardens and, and eat their produce. Can I give you the Ty Jones version? God tells them in their attempt to rebel against their enemies, no, I'm not going to deliver you. But what you do need to do is to get comfortable. The language here not only suggests that they will be there for a long time, but tucked away is also something very different. It resembles what we see in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Remember, it says God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. That in Genesis, they were commanded to multiply in the garden. And God picks up that very same language and tells them to multiply into Babylon. In, in the Garden of Eden, they were called to multiply. But now now in exile in Babylon where they do not desire to be God is also requiring them to multiply where they are. Why would God do such a thing? I believe that God is attempting to teach them and us as well that my power and capabilities are not limited. It does not matter where you are. I can always sustain you right where you are. This should bless somebody here today because I know you find yourself in places that are not favorable and it appears that God is not in any rush to move you from the place where you are it could be because God is attempting to show you I can make you thrive wherever you are you can be in the garden or Babylon you can thrive where you are you can be in the green pastures or in the valley I can make you thrive where you are he can sustain you in Lodabar or Jerusalem you can thrive wherever you are it doesn't matter where you are God can still take care of you and the message to them is if God is responsible for where you are then that same God is responsible for moving you when it's the time to move. So if you are still in a comfortable place, build your house. And if you're still in a comfortable, uncomfortable place, plant your garden until God shows up. Because he can make you thrive wherever you are. I can remember when I was a little bit younger, went to Baylor University. And like everybody, when you go off to school, um, things get tight sometimes. And, you know, I discovered something when I, when I went there around the first of every month. Uh, your apartment complex comes knocking on the door requiring some type of payment. Well, I looked at my account and looked at the calendar um, and, and things were not adding up. And, and so I, I, was, I, was in, I was in trouble. And so I know I might not be as spiritual as some of you listening to me right now, or watching me wherever you are. I prayed a very simple prayer. Lord, the only reason I'm in seminary in the first place is because you called me here. Is that the only reason I'm here trying to learn about your word is because I'm following you now. Lord, I'm your child and I need you to take care of me. I said that, got up from my knees and went on about my day. A few days later, I got a call from a friend of mine. He said, hey, man, he said, you've been on my heart lately. I'm not going to be able to preach at my church on this particular uh, day, on this particular weekend. Will you do me a favor and come fill in for me on this particular weekend before he could even get off of the phone? I said, man, I'll be right there. And I learned a valuable lesson because I not only was able to pay my rent for that month, I was able to pay my rent for the next two months because I learned that day that God will always take care of who God is responsible for. And wherever you are, whether you are in the garden or whether you in Babylon I want to assure you that God is responsible for you and God can make you thrive wherever you may be when it doesn't taste good God assumes responsibility but when it doesn't taste good you got to trust God's perspective I've seen this verse posted so many times Jeremiah 29 11 so many of us like to pull out Jeremiah 29 11 when people Getting on our nerves. 
For I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Somebody stabs you in the back. This is one of the verses we like to put on our news feeds or the post on our timelines or our stories. For I know the plans I, I, I have for you. But you might want to be careful because the message to them is not that I'm going to bring you out. I'm going to turn it around. I may bring you out. I may turn you around, but it's not going to happen right now. Now, this particular verse hinges on three particular, ver three particular words, plans, welfare, and future. That the word plans in Hebrew means essentially exactly what it says. That Isaiah uses uh, this word plans in Isaiah 14, 27, that the Lord armies himself uh, had planned it. Therefore, who can stand in its way? It is the hand that is outstretched, so who can turn back? Isaiah 46, 10 says, I, I declare the end from the beginning and long, long ago what is not yet done, saying my plan will take place and I will do all my will. It appears that, that God is saying whenever I implement the plans of God, no one can stop my plans and no one can alter my plans. But there's another word here that deserves our attention. Plans, but also welfare or or well-being, as the NIV says, or in, in, in NIV it says, plans to prosper you. Now, I know you like that because you, you, you think that, that prosper here is speaking of material gain and, and riches and, and money in the bank account and, and houses perhaps that you don't even qualify. No, no that's not what the word here is. That the, that the word welfare here in the Hebrew is shalom. That when they would meet one another in ancient times, they would meet one another with, with shalom. And I told you before that, that shalom would speak of, a, and of living in agreement with the internal and the external. Uh, but, but it also here also symbolizes that they were to live in shalom in and of themselves, but also they were to be in shalom with the people that they were serving under. They were also to be in shalom with the people and the place that they didn't desire to be in the first place. God didn't want them just to be okay. God also was calling them to be okay with the folk they couldn't stand. And I think that's interesting because sometimes when you and I find ourselves in these positions, oh, we, we think that perhaps God is fumbling the ball, but this isn't so. And then the verse ends, to give you a future and a hope. It's two words in English, but perhaps a uh, one word at Hindiadis in Hebrew that it possibly could read a more hopeful future or a future full of, of hope. That hear me, God and the people had the same intentions, just different timelines. God did not console to get their thoughts on his plan, but they both wanted the same thing. And although we know better, this can be frustrating. It can be hard because uh, we thought that it would have been over by now, but it's these times that we are simply forced to just trust God wherever we are. The other day I was flying from um, Atlanta, Georgia, on my way to Miami, Florida, and my flight got delayed. I, I was so upset because I was tired of being in the airport, and there I was just sitting. As mad as I was, as frustrated as I was, all I could do, at that particular time was just sit and wait until I could get on another flight. And, and while I was sitting there, I began to process uh, this dilemma. Now, you've heard the saying before, delay is not denial. And to some degree, the, the, the statement itself is true. But to another degree, there is implicit denial in delay. De de in delay. You see, because while delay does not deny uh, my ultimate destination. Delay does deny the timing of which I would get there. Uh, see, delay, it, deny, it does not deny me of reaching my destination, but it does deny me of reaching my destination within my timeline. That delay does not totally deny me of where I'm going, but it does deny me of when I will get there. It's in these moments that you and I have to trust the very perspective of God. 1997, a team of IBM engineers put together this a computer called Deep Blue. And this computer had outmaneuvered this chess grandmaster by the name of Gary Kasparov. That Deep Blue was equipped with 
32 processing engines that could calculate up to 200 million chess moves per second. Now, if on a, a lower, lesser, and lighter level, a computer can think 200 million moves per second, how much more on a higher, holier, and heavier level does this apply to our God? I'm simply trying to suggest that in the worst times of your, of your life, you need to trust the perspective of a God whose perspective is always better than yours. And that's why the songwriter says, I'll trust in God wherever I may be upon the land or on the raging sea, for come what may from day to day my heavenly father watch, watches over me he makes the rose the object of his care he guides the eagle through the pathless air and surely he remembers me my heavenly father watches over me I trust in God for in the lion's den or on the battlefield or in the prison's pen though praise or blame through flood or flame my heavenly father watches over me the valley may be dark and, 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 and the shadows deep but oh the shepherd guards his lonely sheep and through the gloom he'll leave Lead me home and my heavenly father watches over me. I trust in God because I know he cares for me on the mountain, bleak or in the stormy sea, though billows roll. He keeps my soul. My heavenly father watches over me. I know you don't like where you are, but trust the perspective of the father that's watching over you. It's not nasty. It just doesn't taste good. Let me call you to some type of action here. Because when it doesn't taste good. There's still responsibility on your part. Verse 12 through 14, you'll call to me, come and, and, and pray to me and I'll listen to you. And you will seek and find me for when you search for me with all your heart, I will be found by you. I wish I could stop at verse 11. Like life would be a lot easier if we could end with the fact uh, uh, that God has a hopeful future or a future full of hope. But listen so verse 11 in the Message Bible says, when you come looking for me, you'll find me. Yes, when you get serious about finding me and want it more than anything, I'll make sure you won't be disappointed. I like that. When you come looking for me, I'll make sure you won't be disappointed. They desired restoration, but God was not going to give them restoration without responsibility. I'll restore you, but I got to be number one in your life. And maybe that's what God is saying to somebody watching me, somebody listening to me, that I'll restore you, but it's going to have to come at the expense of you moving me to the place I need to be in your life. I'll restore the situation, but it'll only come when you prioritize me in the right fashion. You wake up in the morning before checking to see what's on your timeline, what new, what new, new notification has popped up? Is God your priority? When you check your account at the end of the week uh, or in the week of the month, is God your priority? And although you are not serving in a position of power at your job, is your managing of others' time and pay, is God your priority? God doesn't stop there. As a matter of fact, I like how the Christian Standard Bible translated. It says, I will be found by you. Can't think of a more beautiful statement that I'll be found by you, that God does not play hide and seek with his children. I will be found by you, that, that I'm when you look for me, I'll give you access. Following the Civil War, a dejected Confederate soldier was sitting outside the ground of the White House and a young boy approached him and inquired why he was so sad. And the soldier related how he had tried to get the President Lincoln to tell him how unjustly deprived of certain lands in the South following the war. And on each occasion, as he attempted to enter the White House, the guards would not let him enter. That boy, sensing the melancholy of the soldier, grabbed the soldier by the hand. They turned away, walked towards the White House, and that boy motioned to the old soldier to just follow him. And when they approached the entrance of the White House, he, uh, the guards didn't say a word. They just moved out of the way. As they approached each door on the inside of the, of the White House, each uh, security barrier, they just moved out of the way. 
He proceeded to the library, and when he got to the library, there was President Lincoln. He was resting. Uh, he was sitting there resting, uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, that little boy says to President Lincoln, Daddy, this soldier needs to talk to you. What happens here in Jeremiah 29, it lays the foundation for what we see in the New Testament, that you and I need access as well. But because we link up with the Son, you and I have access to the Father as well. It's not that it's nasty. This just doesn't taste good. Lord, thank you for this reality today. Lord, please transform our perspective wherever we are. Lord, it's not nasty that you, you're not preparing this situation with unclean utensils. And no, Lord, you don't have ulterior motives. But Lord, we stand firm today and we are confident in the fact that, Lord, some kind of way, you still have a plan. And for that, we are thankful. And for that, we'll make the decision to thrive wherever we are. It is in your son's name that I do pray. Amen.